lai 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 as well as our dogs in the background barking because they want to say hi. <laughs> um, and uh, we should be good to go. We are recording these on YouTube um, so that you'll be able to go back and watch the broadcast a second time or fill in if you miss a week of the broadcast. Um, that made a lot more sense than thinking that everybody was going to be able to make it every single week and remember every single thing. So this way we have a, rec a record of it and you'll be able to go back and watch. So let's go ahead and get started and say, Brukata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu, Mitzvotah Vitzivanu, Aldivrei Torah. Um, Gabriel, would yeah. you tell the folks in the other room that they could hold their voices down? I would appreciate it. Yeah. So, you're welcome to come in and join us. Though. Okay, no, no. Pull up a chair or whatever you want to do. No, this is the Judaism 101 class. Oh, really Hebrew cool. class is an hour. Oh. So, <clears throat> the name of today's Hebrew 101 class is In the Beginning Tradition. As explained in the Jewish Virtual Library website, tradition has given Judaism a continuity with its past and preserved its character as a unique faith and a distinctive way of life. As the successor to rabbinic Judaism, orthodoxy representing tradition harks back to the Sinai divine revelation and can only be changed within the framework of Jewish law and rabbinic law. In conservative Judaism, tradition is seen as a vital force capable of modifying according to the historical evolution of Jewish law. Reform Judaism has recently displayed a greater appreciation of traditional practices, but their tradition remains voluntary in character. Now, one little thing I'd like to add to this is that all three of these essential movements are all classified as rabbinic Judaism. The point that they're making here is that among the Orthodox, the traditional form of rabbinic Judaism has held a greater sway. Now, the conservative movement would disagree with that to a degree because they would argue, and I think in some cases rightly so, that some orthodoxy has lost, in a sense, the spirit behind traditional Judaism. And so a blend of Judaism is a good thing. What we're focusing on in these classes is an introduction to basic traditional Judaism, small t traditional. There's room within Judaism for all camps and all interpretations of Judaism. And yet one thing that all of us agree on, even the reform, is that orthodoxy, or uh, rather is that tradition is vitally important as tradition reminds us of where we've been. And through tradition, we find our path for where we will go in the future. So what is tradition in terms of our discussion here? For Jews, tradition is everything. Even the Torah itself is included in tradition. Tradition includes everything that has been passed down to us since the very beginning. Tradition is our linchpin to the past. 
It is our guide to the future. As has been said, without our traditions, we would be as shaky as a fiddler on the roof. Collectively, our individual traditions compromise or comprise the limitless flow of Jewish tradition throughout the ages. Tradition includes not only what the Torah says in its Hebrew original, but also how our ancestors understood it. For this reason, you'll find passages throughout the, top, the uh, scriptures, for instance, this one. If your brother, the son of your mother, tempts you in secret, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife of your embrace, or your friend who is like your own soul, saying to you, come, let us go and worship other gods, which, we neither, which neither you nor your forefathers have known. When this happens, a most severe penalty is meted out. We are not to debate the potential merits of this new way. Rather, we are to reject it whole cloth. Why? Because it was not the way of our ancestors. Because it is not tradition. This is a lesson we learned through hard experiences, as described in places like Sefer Shoftim, the biblical book of Judges, and elsewhere. After the passing of Yehoshua, the Israelites left the Derech, and they suffered for it. But Hashem would restore the tradition under a righteous leader, and there would be a time of peace throughout the land until that leader was gone. Then the Israelites would return to their assimilated ways, and hard times and persecutions again resulted. Assimilation has always been the biggest threat to continue Jewish blessing and existence, and the most effective way to avoid assimilation is through tradition. According to the Hebrew book, or Sefer, Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 5, and 1 Chronicles 1, 1 to 3, 10 generations passed from Adam Rishon, which is to say the first Adam, to Noah. These were Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, also called Canaan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, who is also called Hanok, Methuselah, Lamech, and then finally Noah, or Noah, whom God spared from the global flood. Through these initial ten generations, Hashem established the universal seven law covenant. He sealed that covenant with the seventh law through his servant Noah. Ten generations after Adam Rishon. Through this covenant or binding agreement, all people have access to the Creator as we've discussed before. For this reason, the vast majority of people really have no need to convert to any other covenant than the one of their birth. They merely need to observe the Noahide tradition set forth in the Torah and through the teaching of the rabbis. Everyone on earth is, is conceived within their mother's womb into a covenantal relationship with Elohim, the God over all so-called gods, either as a Noahide or as a Jew. Abiding by the terms of one's birth covenant is what the Creator demands, and through its observance, He blesses all those who embrace His design. As we've discussed, Hashem established the universal Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the seven law covenant of the children of Noach, with all of humanity through Noach and his descendants. This covenant or binding agreement is not a religion. We know this because no such religion exists within the Torah, nor is such a religion ever advocated by any of our sages. Therefore, there is no Noahide Siddur. There is no Noahide synagogue. There is no Noahide Shulchan Aruch, etc., despite what some people are claiming and becoming quite wealthy through doing so. The only religious law given to the Noahideen is that they should honor the Creator and stand with the people of Israel and their elders. Judaism refers to Klal Yisrael, which is to say all the people of Israel regardless of their religious practice 
or the lack thereof. Judaism also refers to the religion and the legal code given to Claudius Yisrael at Har Sinai. Some Jews are religiously Jewish. Some Jews are not. The Sinai covenant with Israel is a separate agreement from the Noahide agreement. Nonetheless, we only know of the Sheva Mitzvot B'di Noach through the Jewish scriptures and through rabbinic guidance. The Sinai covenant, however, is exclusively for the members of the Abrahamic family through our patriarchs, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, which today is exclusively defined as rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism is inclusive of all the diverse movements and sects that accept rabbinic authority, as established by the men of the Great Assembly, as we'll discuss later on. Those of the Sinai Covenant are chosen to serve as the nation of priests to the other nations, according to verses like Isaiah 61 6. Tradition. Tradition is how we know who these people are. Through the history of the establishment of the Sheva Mitzvot B'ri Noach itself, we learn of Noach's three sons. In the book of Genesis or Bereshit, the sons are usually listed as Shem, Ham, and Japheth. For example, at Genesis 5.32, 9.18, and 10.1. However, at Genesis 9.24, Ham is said to be the youngest of the sons. And Genesis 10.21 implies that Japheth was the oldest, referring to Shem as the brother of Japheth, the elder. Does this matter? Well, not exactly, but it does establish an important precedent, and Jews look for precedents. We interpret scripture through related scriptures and their context, coupled with insights from our sages of the past. So-called proof texts are often misleading. By understanding the greater context, we understand and receive data, deeper insights. So before determining our beliefs and interpretations, we should always seek to establish precedent from the sages. Bear this in mind as you study. It'll help you avoid a great many errors. Again, tradition. Don't simply say, well, I think this means rather study to find out what the sages of Israel thought it meant. This is a good case in point. Normally, in Mideastern culture, the eldest son receives a greater share of an inheritance. Genesis 9.27 says, May God expand Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. If Japheth, the father of the Western peoples and others, was the eldest, while the middle son, Shem, received the elect position as the, co as the covenant bearer, it can be seen as an interesting foreshadowing of Yitzhak, Isaac, over Ishmael, of Yaakov, Jacob, over Esau, and so on. It also demonstrates, and this is important for Noahides, the vital role intended for Japheth's descendants. They are to protect and empower the descendants of Shem in their role as the nation of priests, as described in Exodus 19.6. The Japhethites are to be the big brothers who watch out for the well-meaning and the well-being of the Shemites, or the Semites through Yaakov, as we perform our priestly duties. Just like Jewish women are exempted from all time-based mitzvot due to their important work in Jewish households and generations, so too with the Noahidim, those who embrace this important task given to Japheth. The Noahidim are not burdened with the 613 Jewish mitzvot, nor with religious rites that would take away from their time. The seven mitzvot of the Noahides direct their direct their way as they assist the Jews so that together the entire planet can be elevated to perfect balance. This perfectly depicts the role of the Noahidim and why it is that the Jews need to stand with the Noahidim and assist them in any way possible. 
We also learn this from Hashem, that he blesses those who blesses Israel, but he curses those, whomever he chooses. And based upon scripture, we know the primary identification for who he chooses to curse. It is clearly defined at Genesis 12.3. Do we have any questions, thoughts, or comments thus far? I'd like to keep questions and comments directly related to what we're talking about. But I do invite your questions on these topics or your comments. Okay, so what we're seeing is. Sorry, uh, Rabbi. Yes, ma'am. Um, why would uh, Hashem curse people? What upsets Hashem? I will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And through Israel, the whole world gets blessed. Genesis 12, 3. Right. So the point being, Israel comes through Shem, the second son. Our big brother, Japheth, is the personification of the role of a Noahide. The Noahidim, which should be all Gentiles, protect us. Protect the little brothers, the middle brothers. As we do our work, they protect us and help us to do. That way we're all working together to bring about the blessings of the earth. Thank you for that question, Dodie. So it's important to understand the role of Noah and the Japhetites as well as the Shemites. So let's continue. There were 10 generations between Adam or Sean and Noah, as we said. A second 10 generations passed between Noah and the, through the line of Shem to Avraham Avinu, another 10 generations to, to Abraham, as described at 1 Chronicles 1, 24 to 27. These generations are Shem, Arpachashad, Selah, Eber, through, the, through whom the holy language of Ivrit, Iver, Ivrit, came to us, or Hebrew as we now know it. It is through Ever or Eber, that Hebrew language was transmitted forward from the beginning. Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahor, Terah, who served Nimrod of Babylon, and who fathered our father, Avraham Avinu who was renamed Avraham. From among the many descendants of Shem, Hashem chose Avraham and established his covenant with he and his descendants, as it says in Genesis 17.2. The Sinai or Mosaic covenant resides within this Avrahamic extended family. So we understand that Hashem decides the lineages of his people. We have the opportunity to accept those lineages or to reject them. Avraham Avinu was born under the name Avram bin Terah in the city of Ur in Babylonia in the year 1948 HH or Haluach Havri, the Jewish reckoning from creation according to the Bible. This would have been circa 1800 BCE. To Avram, Hashem confirmed his singular nature as recorded in a fascinating story from the Midrash Bereshit 38.13. That Midrash reads as follows. Avraham's father, Terah, was an idol manufacturer. Once he had to travel. So he left Avraham to manage his shop. People would come in and they would ask to buy idols. Avraham would say, how old are you? And the person would say, 50 or 60. And Avraham would say, isn't it pathetic that a man of 60 wants to bow down to a one day old idol? The man would feel ashamed and he would leave. One time, a worker came in with a basket of bread. She said to Avraham, please take this and offer it to the gods. 
But Avraham got up, took a hammer in his hand, broke all the idols to pieces, and then put the hammer in the hand of the biggest idol among them. When his father came back and saw all the broken idols, he was appalled. Who did this? He cried. How can I hide anything from you, dear father? Replied Avraham calmly. A woman came in with a basket of bread and told me to offer it to them. I brought it in front of them, but each one of them said, I'm going to eat first. And then that big one over there got up, took his hammer, and broke all the other ones to pieces. What are you trying to pull on me, said Terak? Do they have minds? Said Abraham, listen to what your own mouth is saying. They have no power at all. So why do you worship idols? I've mentioned this story before. I've retold it a number of times. This Midrash is told in a number of different ways. But what we see here very clearly is that Avram, from a very young age, realized the falsity of paganism, the falsity of trinities and Baal worship, and the idea of God manifesting as a human being or as an idol. Rather, Avraham knew that the one true God is beyond all form, that he alone rules. And Avraham knew this from an early age. As a young man, Avram was directed by Hashem to leave his country and to head to what would later become the land of Israel. It was then known as the land of Canaan, or Canaan, and it was filled with various warring pagan factions. Factions. These are described in great detail in the book of Judges and in the Torah. Avram obeyed. Avram married Sarai, who was later renamed Sarah, and had various adventures as described in Bereshit. Avram and Sarah lived to ripe old ages, but they never had any offspring to pass the inheritance of the covenant onto, until God decided to intervene. Through a series of devastating events that happened in the plains of the Dead Sea, also known as the Salt Sea, Avram showed himself to be a great man, devoted to Hashem and his fellows. For example, he rescued Lot and the people of the plains who had been conquered and enslaved. This is described in Genesis 13, 13 to 16, 1. Due to his faithfulness, Hashem promised Avram that he would father many generations and great nations. See Genesis 13, 16. Beginning at Genesis 16, 1, the events unfold that finally led to the origin of the nation and the people that we know of as Israel, the Jews. In order to determine who is a Jew and who is not, and what Judaism is, we must understand the origins according to our traditions. Because they had both grown old and were still without the promised child to carry forth the covenant, see Genesis 15, 4 and 18, 10, their imuna began to wane. Their faith began to wane. And Sarah suggested that Avram should have sex with her, with her Egyptian servant Hagar in order to produce the promised offspring, as described in Genesis 12, 2. This was an example of imuna mixed with doubt. Faith that the child of promise would come, but doubt drove them to seek to fulfill the terms themselves rather than to rely on Hashem. Similar mistakes have resulted in many failed prophets and would-be messiahs over the years. We must remember that Hashem is in control of all situations we face, not human philosophy nor ingenuity. What he says will happen, will happen. Number 23, 19. While we are commanded to do our best, Judaism is a path of doing, after all. We must always rely on Hashem for the results. His word never fails. 1 Kings 8, 56. The result of their lack of complete emuna and bitachon, or active faith and trust, here continues to plague the world today. Avram did as Sarai suggested and Hagar became pregnant, Genesis 16, 4. 
Through her son Ishmael came the Northern Arabs, and through them eventually Muhammad Mustafa, the founder of Islam. Had their Amuna and Bitacham at this point in history been stronger, Islam would never have come into existence, and the world would be a radically different place. At this point in time, Avram was 86 years old. He and Sarai, his wife, had lived 10 years in the land of Israel, then called Palestine, uh, then called Canaan, rather. God did not accept their attempt to fulfill his promise. He declared that the promised child would come through Avram and Sarah, as he had spoken at 16, 19 to 21. Sarah soon realized her mistake, and she made teshuva, or repentance, although it was tainted with jealousy towards Hagar and her son. Avram authorized his wife to send both the child and her servant away if she desired at 16.6, and she did so. However, understand that we each have free will, and our choices have consequences, as we see here. Now that Ishmael existed, he had human rights, and those had to be honored. Hashem used their lapse of faith, their lapse of amuna, to fulfill his own purposes. Everything ultimately works according to God's plan, and he demonstrated compassion on Hagar and upon her son Ishmael, as it says at Genesis 16.7. Of this we read at 16.9, And the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, Return to your mistress, Sarai, and allow yourself to be afflicted under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your seed, and it will not be counted for abundance. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you will conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your affliction. Note carefully how Ishmael, however, once born, is described as the section continues at 1612. He will be a wild ass of a man. His hand will be upon all, and everyone's hand will be upon him. And before all of his brothers, he will dwell. When Avram was 100 years old, Yitzhak, or Isaac, was born, as promised. Hashem revealed how he would deal with the people of the covenant from there on. Circumcision, which is the sign of the covenant in human flesh, and other issues are presented here and discussed. Avraham at this point is renamed Avraham, as described in Genesis 17, 1 to 7. Sarai is renamed Sarah at Genesis 17, 15. Then Hashem says that he will, beginning at 17, 7 to 9, establish my covenant between me and between you, and between your seed throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be to you for a God, and to your seed after you. And I will give you and your seed after you the land of your soldiers, Eretz Yisrael, the entire land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be for them a God. And God said to Avram, You shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you, throughout your generations. One thing should become abundantly clear as you study the Tanakh. Hashem is an individual being, beyond our conception, yes, but a being who says, I will, I do, I demand, I bless, I punish. The idea of God as some kind of a force from Star Wars is utterly anti-biblical. And it's a trap that many of our people today are falling into. Hashem is God. He's not some kind of an impersonal energy for him. But we digress. In this way, as described, from Abraham through Yitzhak, the covenant was eternally established, and it passed down through his descendants, and it continues to do so. But the question is, through which line? Through Ishmael or through Isaac? Would the covenant pass through Ishmael as maintained by Islam? 
the son fathered during Avram's lapse of Amuna with a servant of his beloved wife? Or would it pass through Sarai as God had declared? As far as we know, Ishmael was the only son of Abraham born before Sarah conceived. Hashem has stated and clarified the lineage, and he clearly declares this in Scripture through whom the sacred covenant would pass. All you need to do is go to Bedashit 17, 16 to 21, which reads, And I will bless Sarah. And I will give you, Abraham, a son from her. And I will bless her, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be of her. And Aram said to God, If only Ishmael would live before you. And God said, Indeed, your wife Sarah. Notice he goes back. Abraham says, How about Ishmael? No, no, let's talk about her for a minute. Indeed, your wife Sarah will bear you a son. And you are to name him Yitzhak or Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. And regarding Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. He will beget 12 princes, and I will, be, and I will make of him great nations. These great nations are the northern Arab tribes. But my covenant, verse 21, but my covenant I will establish with Yitzhak, whom Sarah, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. And of course, this is precisely what happened. The covenant people arose through Abraham, Yitzhak, and his son Yaakov, or Jacob. These three are our patriarchs. These three are the fathers of our people. Both the text and all context are abundantly clear on this point. Bereshit 17, 21. My covenant I will establish with Yitzhak, whom Sarah will, build, will bear to you this time next year. And 21, 1 to 5 reads, And the Lord remembered Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah, as he had spoken. And Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at that time of which God had spoken to him. And Avram named his son, who had been born to him, whom Sarah had born to him, Yitzhak. And Avram circumcised his son, Yitzhak, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Yitzhak was born to him. Notice all the repetitive nature in this section. His son Yitzhak, a born to Sarah, really, really emphasizing it, lest anybody misunderstand the lineage of the covenant. So, here is the covenant of the ancestry of the covenant people of God. It began with Adam Rishon. Adam Rishon, Rishon meaning the first. Adam with Eve or Hava. From Adam through Seth, through Noah, through Shem, through Abraham and Sarah, through Yitzhak or Isaac, who was the promised son, through Yaakov, who was renamed Israel, and through the 12 houses or tribes born to the son of Israel, sons plural of Israel. Through the patriarchs. So this is a surface understanding of what the Torah clearly says, as it clearly arranges the foundation of our people. With the Torah, there's always deeper understandings. And you can go deeper and deeper. But before we look a little bit deeper, does anyone have any questions, thoughts, or comments? Kelsey says, so the pit of fire that Avram was tossed into by Nimrod could be the same furnace that never could have. Well, it wouldn't be the same furnace, but it's the same idea. It was a common practice back in the day, yeah. Uh, questions, thoughts, or comments about what we've, what we've discussed so far? It's probably pretty obvious to most of us. But if there are any questions, 
it's important that we understand these foundational principles. Islam claims that Avraham offered Ishmael, not Yitzhak. There are many plagiarized theories that come out of the Quran and out of the teachings of Muhammad and Mustafa. We, however, hold strictly to Torah. And we reject any ideologies that contradict Torah. Rabbi, right. I have a question. It's yes, Cecily. Yeah. Yes, thank you. It's very nice. When you use the word patriarchy, you know, my um, secular brain thinks of the patriarchy that is being so demonized in culture today. So was, was our tradition the founding of the patriarchy as it's used today? Probably not. Um, in the ancient world, usually, the ancient world was usually divided into tribes like we divided into tribes and with the heads of the families making the rules. Generally speaking, those heads of families were males primarily because of physical strength and authority in battle. Um, but when we say the patriarchs, the patriarchs had wives and we'll be discussing their wives. Um, but biblically speaking, all of these powers the and all of these authorities. So, uh, the, the, the only explanation is that the spermatic machines had uh, been. Cartrell, could you mute or something, please? I'm not sure what that was. Um, but all of the biblical authority and lineages pass through the males, through the three patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then Yaakov has the 12 sons and one daughter. Since he had 12 sons, men continued to lead the tribes. Now, once we get into the book of Judges, we begin seeing some powerful women like Devorah, Deborah. There have been incredibly strong, powerful women in Jewish history. Women, in fact, according to most of Judaism, are the backbone of our, of our way, especially today. Without women, there would be no Jewish synagogues on earth. But one of the reasons why the New Age philosophy is so anti-patriarchy is twofold. One, the Bible is a patriarchic system. And two, men being humans have often abused their authority and abused the women under them and belittled the women, something that Judaism does not do. Judaism praises and elevates our women, the women who are Jew, Jews, um, but it's one of those things. It's like we tend to say, use male pronouns for God, but we know God is not a male. God has no gender. God transcends, but we still use that patri patriarchal language when referring to the Holy One, but it's also rational to do so because in Hebrew, like in English until fairly recently, Hebrew still, if you have a group of males, you use the masculine pronoun. If you have a group of females, you use a female pronoun. But if you've got a group of females with just one or two men, you still use the masculine pronoun because the masculine pronoun in Hebrew and in English, in the, at least in the past, implied both male and female. It was not viewed as exclusively male. That meant the people, mankind. Um, that is changing in American vocabulary. It is still that way in modern Hebrew, however, and in Spanish and most of the languages. So, on, mm -hmm. on this, so subject. we're not. So we're not. Um, we're not praising the patriarchy. We are simply speaking of the fact that the Bible is. A patriarchal book and we we talk about our matriarchs the wives of the patriarchs the four wives and they're holy they're righteous and but biblical history we talk about the patriarchs in 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 the patriarchs and and in the male being head and then you have the valorous wife she has a lot of power. A lot and of women he, have a lot of power. 
and he is he has the ultimate say, but she is running things while he's studying. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, I just wanted yeah. to make sure that, that that I'm looking at it correctly. You are, you are. So we have to acknowledge the fact this is a Middle Eastern religion. Mid, the Middle East is patriarchal. Torah, however, presents a religion and a legal code that is the most pro-feminist in the world. For example, back in biblical times, women simply didn't buy, buy own land, unless you're like the Amazons or something. But in the Bible, there were women who had lost their fathers and when it came to the inheritance, they said, well, what about us? And Torah allows women to inherit property. That was unheard of anywhere until fairly modern times. So I hope that addresses that for you. Let's look a little bit more now from a more spiritual perspective. So we have three daily prayers. The first prayer, Shakrit, we do inspired by Avraham. The second is inspired by Yitzhak, and the evening prayer is inspired by Yaakov. Their presence continues to exist with us. So here's a mystical take on some symbolism. We're going to keep this fairly short, but through the patriarchs, the creator has revealed the light of Ein Sof, the transcendent light, into the darkened realms of the great void. Through Avraham, the infinite light was granted passage, filling material existence with potentiality due to the promise of the covenant. What does this mean? It means that human beings very quickly after Adam rebelled against God. We had a chance with Noah, and we got the seven laws, and we quickly rebelled. So there had to be some way for the light to come into the world, there needed to be some type of a mediation or a moderation. Hashem, knowing everything, knew that he would establish Israel through Yaakov, and that through Israel he would establish Yehuda, Judah, and that through that would come the elders and the sages and the prophets and the entire structure. So knowing this was going to happen, through Avraham, our father, came the infinite light, giving the potential that we might understand beyond our kin. And then, through Yitzhak, the infinite light was contracted so that humanity could conceive of it. And through Yaakov, this contracted infinite light becomes a beam or a ray capable of piercing the human consciousness. So through the three patriarchs, the light of God became knowable because of the glory of the covenant. Through Avraham, we can conceive, therefore, of the omnipresent Elohim, the God of gods. Through Yitzhak, we become responsible workers of free will in relation to pleasing the omnipresent as we begin to taste and to conceive the glories of the sacred name where instead of worshiping the God of gods, we worship a God who is named. We worship the sacred one with four-letter name who we call Hashem and Adonai. And then through Yaakov, we experience and we embrace the divine providence of Hashem. And through that divine providence, we are able to manifest his light outward throughout all the creation for the purpose of drawing everything back into harmony with the source. This reunification is the very reason for our existence. And we call this sacred work Tikkun Olam, the preparing of the broken. Sarah died in Hebron in the West Bank at 127 years of age, according to Genesis 23, 1-20. In Genesis chapter 4, Avraham made a presentation for Yitzhak, made preparations rather for Yitzhak to marry Rebekah. In 2467, Isaac takes Rebekah into his mother's tent as his wife through a process that is still known as an Isaac wedding. In other words, 
without clergy or religious rites, simply with the covenant, the intention of the heart of the couple, followed by their marital union. After Sarah passed away, Avraham remarries a woman who is simply known as Keturah, a woman that all of our authorities agree was African and who was noted for her beautiful ebony skin. Torah says practically nothing else about this woman. The end of life marriage of Abraham had no impact on the covenant, which remained firmly and eternally with Sarah's son Isaac, then Yaakov, and then his descendants. Some rabbinic authorities, including Rashi, say that Keturah was actually Hagar. However, there are some really good reasons why this seems highly unlikely. While some may like the idea of tying up loose ends or trying to close the circle of restoration for Ishmael and his mother, who admittedly got a raw deal to the family, as Rashi's grandson, the Rashbam, and as Ibn Ezra and several others bluntly state, according to the plain meaning of the text, Keturah could not have been Hagar. It was likely said as an appeasement that she was Hagar to the new religio-political movement of Islam that was seeking to find a validation for itself in our scriptures during the time of Ramba, of uh, Ramka, of uh, Rashi and the others. There's points that you can make on both sides to try to justify this view. But having rejected Hagar, Returning her would seem to be a violation of the halakhic prohibition against remarrying an ex-spouse. Now, the halakha says you can actually you can remarry an ex-spouse, assuming that the ex-spouse has not remarried another. But nothing in the scripture tells us anything about whether or not Hagar did or what happened to her. <clears throat> Likewise, the scripture and the argument does not provide any reasonable explanation of why she would be called Hagar, and then Keturah, and then Hagar again in a very short space of text. Nor why the text implies that she was a different woman and makes no comment about the return of such a significant biblical character as Hagar. Likewise, given the subsequent history, and Hashem knows past, future, and everything, given the subsequent history between the Jews and the Muslims, for Hashem to have blessed such a reunion and to equate that marriage to Hagar equal to the marriage of Sarah would have been dishonoring to Sarah and to our father Yitzhak, and it would have called the lineage of the covenant into open question. Ishmael is specifically, in text, excluded from the inheritance of the covenant in places like Genesis 17:21. The covenant only passes through, and that exclusively, through Isaac, and scripture makes this clear. Genesis 25, 5. And Avraham gave all that he possessed to Isaac. This was after the fact. And to the sons of Avraham's concubine, Ishmael, Avraham gave some gifts, and then he sent them away from his son Isaac while he was, while he, Avraham, was still alive eastward into the lands of the east. Hagar and Ishmael ended up in Mecca. Avraham's death is recorded in Genesis 25, 8. Avraham and the sons of Avraham's concubines, including Ishmael, come back to bury him. And then we read at Genesis 25, 11, it came to pass after the death of Avraham that God blessed Isaac, his son. And Isaac dwelt by Bir Lahai Roy. So following Avraham's death, Hashem himself reaffirmed that the covenant passed through our father Yitzhak, restoring Hagar to Avraham. Would have, been, would have been a needless muddying of the waters of this important lineage. There simply is no biblical support for the view that Hagar was Keturah, nor that they were the same women. There's also a theory that says that he had two more, so three wives, one being Hagar, one being Keturah, and one being another woman. All we have from scripture is married to Sarah, Sarah dies, and, he remar and then he marries Keturah. That's all we have in scripture. What we know, the covenant passed from Yitzhak to Yaakov or Jacob, from Jacob to the 12 tribes, including Judah and Benjamin. And through Judah, 
It continues to move forward to this very day, the door of a door. As we continue, we'll be looking more into the heritage and the traditions underlying the peoplehood of the Israeli or Jewish people. This ends our considerations for today. I hope that you're enjoying them. You can rewatch them on YouTube and um, you're welcome to uh, get your questions if you have any and PM me privately and we can discuss these. Right now we have about five or six minutes for questions before we get to our Hebrew class. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Try to keep it real short. Why, why can't a person marry his, his or her ex-spouse? Okay, so what the Torah says, the Torah does not exactly uh, deal with the question. What the Torah clearly says is that if you were married and got divorced, if the spouse remarries and that spouse divorces them, you are halakhically forbidden to remarry them because that would have been viewed as a double indemnity of, of, uh, of the marriage covenant. Judaism permits divorce, but it doesn't like divorce. So if you divorce your wife, it should be finalized. Now, there are some Jewish authorities who say that if the partner has not remarried, and then there's questions, how about they had sex outside of marriage? Everything's debated. But clearly, if they, haven't, if they have remarried, they can't. You can't remarry them. Um, so it's a big debate about all this. What we can say is that knowing this and knowing the importance of Avram, the fact that no one challenges or questions this, and the fact that it's not in the Torah to even address the question is a strong evidence against Ketorah and Hagar being the same person. But once you end a marriage, you end it and the marriage stays ended. Um, there's actually, it was actually sort of a funny rabbinic debate that I saw, but <laughs> I'm not going to get into that one. The Jews love to debate things and twist stuff around. It's really weird. So for instance, let's say so the thing with, so you and your neighbor, you're both Jewish and you both are attracted to the other one's wife. Okay. You could divorce your wife and then she could sleep with the other man. She's not committing adultery against you. After she does that, you could remarry and your neighbor could remarry. You could sort of swap wives like that. This is one of those attempts where Jews try to find loopholes. Yeah, the, it's absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, it's, it's totally unacceptable. It would be trying to find a loophole. We love to find loopholes. That's why Jews make such good lawyers. If you marry, if you're a Jewish man, you're required to marry a Jewish woman. When you marry, you are to marry for life. But things happen in marriages. If you get divorced, then you are not going to remarry that wife. You can make an argument if they haven't gotten married, but don't marry a person you don't want to spend your life with and don't divorce a person that you want to remarry if you're Jewish. And I would say, period. There are no such laws, by the way, for the Nalajim, but the principle is still there. Okay, let's um, let's take a real quick break um, so that people can stretch their legs before we get to a Ahuva. Um, I'm thinking this is a nice short one here. And we'll be back in about six minutes, and Ahuva will be taking over the reins for the Hebrew class. Bro. 
across the sea Just you and me Together we'll cross below these mountains We will cross the fire We will reach the high Together Live forever If I Won't cry Would you open up my heart If I wanted to sing Would you let me play your heart If I wanted to leave Would you show me where you From the past, from you, so the things that we've been through, we only knew that your love was always true. I did believe.
I can't hear anyone. We're oh. still on uh, live on YouTube, by the way. Thank you. So I turned. I haven't interrupted. So I turned it so we can everybody else can see this. This is our den. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Hula now. If anyone has any questions for me, let's talk maybe after her Hebrew class so we can jump right into the Hebrew class. I will have a question for you, Rabbi, after class. Okay. After class would be cool. Um, so um, for now, though, I'm going to mute myself and give it over to a Hula. Uh, Hoover, you know, you've got your mic done. Thank you. Thank you. If you're on YouTube, we don't do the Hebrew class on YouTube. If you would like, you're welcome to hop over to the showroom for the Hebrew class, but we're going to be leaving you now on YouTube. Thank you for being with the Judaism 101.